what I'm going to try to do now is actually take you through time <clears throat> to a bit of history and show you a different side of the Near East Relief, Near East Foundation, which I hope um, will be an interesting uh, journey for you. So on July 16th, 1915, Henry Morgenthau, the U.S. Ambassador in Constantinople, sends a cable to the State Department. I quote him, Deportations of and excesses against peaceful Armenians is increasing, and from harrowing reports of eyewitnesses, it appears that a campaign of race extermination is in progress under the pretext of reprisal against rebellion. Note the words that he uses, race extermination, the word genocide was not even invented then, but literally translated, race extermination is the equivalent of the words genos, which defined in the Greek language as race, and side in the Latin language as murder. A few weeks later, Morgenthau writes again, the destruction of the Armenian race in Turkey is rapidly progressing. He makes an urgent request to the Secretary of State. Will you suggest that Cleveland Dodge, Charles Crane, John R. Mott, Stephen Weiss, and others to form a committee to raise funds and provide means to save some of the Armenians and assist the poorer ones to immigrate? This news makes its way to President Woodrow Wilson who has close ties with the leaders of the missionary movement who are in the Ottoman Empire. These messages are forwarded to James L. Barton and Cleveland H. Dodge. Barton, 60 years old at the time, was the Foreign Secretary of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions based here in, near Boston. He was an ordained congregational minister. He had served as a missionary in Harput, and was later the president of Euphrates College, something that many people don't know is he spoke fluent Armenian. Dodge, on the other hand, was a successful businessman and philanthropist, the Dodge Phelps Copper Mining Company. He had been a Princeton classmate of President Woodrow Wilson, one of his closest confidants. Barton writes to his friend Dodge, who was in New York, I am convinced that an early and comprehensive conference should be convened in your office for consideration of the Armenians. The situation is certainly critical. The Armenians have no one to speak for them, and it would be without question a time of when the voice of Christianity should be raised. Now, this is the summer of 1915. We all know why there was no one to speak on behalf of the Armenians, because on April 24th, 1915, the leadership of all the Armenian communities were rounded up and either executed or deported or imprisoned. So there was truly no one to speak for them. Within two weeks of Morgenthau's telegram, a meeting is convened at the office of Dodge. In addition to Dodge and Barton, other prominent businessmen and religious leaders, such as Charles Crane, John Mott, Rabbi Stephen Weiss, are present at what becomes the initial meeting of the Committee on Armenian Atrocities. Over the next few years, the name goes through several iterations. The American Committee for Armenian and Syrian Relief, later changing to the American Committee for Relief in the Near East, known by its acronym ECHORN. And in 1919, the organization was incorporated by an act of Congress as the Near East Relief only one of two organizations at the time operating under such a mandate, the other being the American Red Cross. The goal of the organization was to raise $100,000, which would be sent to Morgenthau, to provide the emergency aid that he had requested for the Armenians. The foreword in the initial minute book states, it should be kept in mind that at this time the whole situation was regarded as temporary, and the committee had no thought of permanent work. Almost immediately, the Rockefeller Foundation provides half of the funding while the rest of the board members provide the remainder. Little did they know that they were about to embark on one of the largest non-governmental humanitarian missions in U.S. history. It was the birth 
of what became known as citizen philanthropy on an international level not to have been seen in American history at this time. An unprecedented $116 million in funds and supplies were raised during the period of 1915 to 1930. That represents over $2 billion in today's standards. In 1922, an article in the New York Times, it cites that the Near East Relief Report that it had to provide reports in Congress that at least one million lives had been saved. The Near East Relief goes on to rescue 132,000 orphan children, consisting largely of Armenians, but also Greeks and Assyrians and other minorities affected by genocide and the war. A sophisticated national campaign was implemented across hundreds of communities in the United States. Playing on the emotions of the citizenry, they used terms like, give or we perish, the child at your door, or they shall not perish, which is the name of our exhibit that you see outside. In this depiction of one of the more well-known posters, Lest They Perish, you'll see that the artist William Gunning King uses one of the photographs of the Near East Relief to render his imagery. <clears throat> you can see here this woman who is carrying a child on her back. What probably is most likely in one of the Arab villages in, in the refugee camps at this point, but they're almost identical in the way that the child is facing, her headband, the scarf, the way her hands are clasped, and the, the uh, dress itself. But um, the, the, the scenery from behind is, is obviously removed for, for greater impact and replaced with a um, ruined house. In one of the new Near East magazines, we find another clue about this subject. An image of this picture appears with the caption, this sad Armenian mother, her baby, the prodigy of an enemy race is depending as are others on us. Talk about really hitting the emotional chords. Churches of all denominations and synagogues mobilized their congregations to raise funds towards this effort. Chapters were organized in all 48 states at the time. Hawaii and Alaska were still territories, but they also had offices. The concept of sponsoring a child was even introduced. So I want to show you some of the paraphernalia and the materials. You'll note many of the Armenian traditional names are, are used in here. So this concept of adopting a child, this booklet here, The Life of a Child, is actually uh, a coupon booklet. You can see the coupons on the, on the, the, the bottom image. Um, but the concept here was for $60 a year you can feed a child. So they were uh, asking uh, Americans to adopt children. And it even went as far as the first ladies uh, of successive um, American uh, presidents uh, adopted these children, not in the literal sense but in the, in the figurative sense through supporting them. Some other images of the handouts. Billboards were used. Many of you are now seeing billboards being raised to commemorate the Armenian genocide all around the country. Spokespersons such as child star Jackie Coogan and Ambassador Morgenthau were recruited for the cause. Some of you in my generation may remember Jackie Coogan as Uncle Fester from the Adams Family. But back at this time, he was a well-known, famous child uh, silent movie actor with Charlie Chaplin in the famous movie called The Kid, where he plays an orphan. What better spokesperson to represent the orman, orphans overseas than one who portrays himself to one? So here we have the beginning of celebrity activism. So people like George Clooney and Angelina Jolie have Jackie Coogan to thank for starting this. Then, of course, a new form of medium is introduced, the silent film. 
Nirish Relief produced a motion picture called Ravished Armenia to tell the story of genocide survivor Aurora Mardaganian, who surprisingly plays herself in the film. There's no complete copy of this film. Everyone has looked high and low. But about 10 years ago, a 20-minute segment was found in the Soviet archives. And that has been uh, shown in many places. Um, it's on YouTube if you care to, to see it. And understand, it is a reenactment. It is not real scenes of genocide that are taking place, but it is chillingly real looking. It was filmed in the deserts of California. So think of Aurora's story as the moral equivalent of Anne Frank's diary, or today's heroine, the Pakistani Nobel laureate Malala. <clears throat> Yet again, artists invoke the imagery of this period. Now Alice was not Armenian, she was of Jewish descent. As I mentioned earlier, the Near East Relief helped not just the Armenians, but other minorities that were being persecuted and affected by the war at the time. Ms. Dorea, however, raises her as a congregationalist. Alice's parents had died while she was young, and her older sister was unable to care for her, so she put her in the Near East Relief orphanages. And there are some beautiful pictures of the Constantinople orphanage in the courtyard and where she would dance as a child, and then the pictures of her adopted mother and the two of them together. Truly a very close and warm relationship. We are fortunate that Alice is still with us today. I had the pleasure of meeting her many years ago. She will turn 103 years old in August. While she could not travel here to be with us, her daughter, the Reverend Elise Kinney Woods, is here with us today. Elise, can you please stand? I truly have enjoyed our relationship over now six, seven years, and the relationship with your mother, Alice, who has um, been nothing but charming in all the conversations that we've had and all the stories that she has uh, shared with us about her memories of this, of this period. And unlike Aurora's story, which, which was tragic, because even though she had suffered um, rape, uh, witnessed the murder of her family, and had um, been enslaved and escaped, came to America, and regretfully um, became a poster child, no one having diagnosed that this poor child had suffered from PTSD, as we would call it today. They toured her around the film, had her reenact herself in the film, to reenact the, watching the murders and the rapes and everything that went on. She had a much more tragic life and, and regret, regretfully um, uh, died, died alone and was buried in an unmarked grave in, in California. But I'm pleased to say that Alice's story did not turn out that way. Alice's story was that she fell in love, married a wonderful husband, had two wonderful children, grandchildren, and has lived a long and blessed life and remembers her memories of her adopted mother quite fondly. So I'm pleased that her story was a happy one. Even the great American icon, Babe Ruth, is seen here donating the bat with which he hit his 50th home run in 1920 to be auctioned so that he could raise funds for the Near East Relief. The woman in this picture is a Near East Relief um, orphan who was actually working for the Near East Relief at this time. I just want to point out how ingrained in American culture this issue was at this time that all these iconic figures from the President of the United States all the way down to the school children that were donating their condensed cans of milks. Everyone was involved. The word Armenian was on everybody's mind. In fact, so much so that on uh, International Golden Rule Sunday was introduced in all of the Sunday schools where the term, remember the starving Armenians, became a household slogan when parents used it to describe to their children to make sure you clean your plate, remember those starving Armenians. Everywhere from Main Street to any town USA, from the president to the youngest school children, everyone did their part. 
And of course, for this, the Armenian orphans returned their gratitude and symbols of those gratitude through images like the one you're seeing, where this one is in Alexandropol today, Gumri in Armenia, where over 2,500 orphans are lined up for this picture to say, America, we thank you. And this orphanage alone, Gumri, uh, housed over 35,000 children over the period of its operations. So, so remarkable um, work that was done here. Presidential involvement. <clears throat> One might only think of Woodrow Wilson, but the list goes on. Herbert Hoover was a board member of the Near East Relief. Calvin Coolidge was president while the Near East Relief operations continued, and I'll talk more about him in a minute. Theodore Roosevelt was an outspoken supporter and sometimes critic of the Near East Relief for not doing enough. In fact, he was a very outspoken critic against uh, the U.S. not intervening militarily to protect the, the Armenians and to further prevent the genocide. Franklin Roosevelt, as a senator, sat on the board of the Near East Relief, and so did William Howard Taft. <clears throat> In 1925, 400 girls from the Ghazir Orphanage in Lebanon wove a carpet, which was presented as a Christmas gift to President Calvin Coolidge. I think many of you know of this story, and if my friend Dr. Martin Duranian is in the audience, I want to wish him a special thank you for all the work that he has done. He's a member of your community here, and we all know he's, he dedicated a significant portion of his life making sure that this rug would be viewed instead of being shown, being kept in the, um, the basements of the White House, and he got that wish finally uh, last year when it was um, put on display. Is Martin here by any chance? He's not here. No, he's not here. He's been here all and wife's had him. Well, please send him my regards and, and I, will, I will write to him as well. To I spoke with him yesterday and he expressed he was hoping that he might be able to come, but he said it's more unlikely. Okay. <clears throat> I want to read to you an important quote by President Calvin Coolidge, who five years after receiving this rug, reflects in Barton's book, The Story of Near East Relief, in the introduction. He writes, those who dwell in the Near East have been impressed through the work of this committee with what they regard as the true spirit of our people. They have not been able to detect in its years of service any ulterior motive, taint of politics, territorial ambitions, bid for spheres of influence, or sectarian propaganda. They can see embodied in the 15 years of disinterested operations the sincere desire and purpose to render help to peoples in extreme need and to give it without expectation or even the possibility of return in anything except the expressions of gratitude from those helped and consciousness of having responded to a call to duty. Should we all aspire to respond to that call to duty? And over the years, the Near East Relief provided food, clothing, and shelter for approximately a million refugees. It rescued over 132,000 orphans, and it cared for them through a vast network of schools, orphanages, vocational training centers all across the Middle East. And I think what's important here is this is the beginning of sustainable development. It was not just enough to provide food and shelter, but they went one step further, one very important step further, with respect to reintegrating these poor souls who had no parents back into society as productive members, to reintroduce them to their language. Yes, they did teach them Armenian. They retaught them the Christian faith. They retaught them their, the importance of their culture. So these individuals were the exact opposite of what genocide perpetrators were where the genocide perpetrators destroyed schools, they destroyed people, they destroyed the, the institutions uh, that preserve our culture. These American heroes did the exact opposite. They restored all of that. The 
this becomes the model for sustainable development that was used for the Marshall Plan, the Peace Corps, U.S. Agency for International Development, known as USAID, and the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. So the roots of this organization goes all the way back to this point. Now, what I'd like to do is I always like to tell you a story of one of these, these orphans. And there is one in particular. Her name was Mari Libarian. And later in her life, uh, she reflected on, on this period. And she writes uh, in her memoirs, this is directed to towards her children, I always wished to write my memories while I was alive, but I delayed it for a long time so that you don't have to listen to my sad stories while you were young and while I am alive. I want my children to live happily forever instead of being sad and depressed in their life. I always kept to myself all those horrible things that happened to me during the deportation, and I don't want my children to see or experience what I have experienced. I have always wished for my children's happiness throughout the rest of their lives. She goes on to write, in 1915, we were driven out of our homes. We got on the road. I don't know where they were taking us. All we knew was that it was called a deportation. Now, she was eight years old at the time. During the same year, I lost my mother and father with the grace of God. After they were gone, the suffering got worse. We were under the tents in a desert called Shatma when the news came that we were going to be driven to Der Zor. My older brother, Hovannes, helped us escape from the camp to a city called Kilis. My brothers could not stay there for long, hence they managed to take off to the other cities in Turkey. One of them went to Etesya, or as we know as Urfa, and the other to Einteb. We never heard from my brother Yesai again. We were left orphans all by ourselves. It was our neighbors that helped us to get into the orphanage. There were five of us, four sisters, and the youngest of the brother, Hagop, was three or four years old. The oldest of us was my sister, Takuhi, who was only 15 years old, and she was taking care of all of us the best that she could. My youngest sister was very young. She had just stopped feeding on my mother's milk a few months before my mother had died. In the orphanage, there were some children who were close to death, and they were left in the basement. My older sister, Arshalus, was among them, and she was lying down in bed with her belly swollen from some kind of illness. My oldest sister, Takuhi, quickly went down and picked her up, got her ready to take her with us for another deportation. We did not know where we were going again. It did not last long here. When we came to this orphanage, we felt like we had finally found a safe and comfortable place. But then they came to deport us again. The next day, we climbed up the mountain to find some grass to eat. There was not enough food for everyone. The boys were desperately collecting grass for food. Some children went to bed hungry at night and would not get up in the morning. We were losing two to three children to hunger every passing day. My little brother, Hagop, got sick from eating the grass that he had picked. My older sister had some valuable silver jewelry with her. She managed to get some milk and eggs from the Kurds in the mountain to feed my brother so that he could survive. We came to another village where we were welcomed by the locals. They gave us big houses with courtyards in the middle. They did not take us into the city because they said we were dirty and full of mi microbes. However, our food was delivered from the city, at least thanks for that. There were also some neighboring mothers who were taking care of us. After a while, they took us to the city orphanage in Kilis, which was run by an American Protestant organization, presumably the Near East Relief. They were taking care of us very well. We were being educated, we had daily schooling and some training. At this orphanage, we were always protected against intruders by any means possible. However, sometimes by the old order of call Kaimakan, the town administrator or the lawyer, soldiers would come and order us to line up so they could pick anyone they wanted to take away. 
to escape this situation, the den mothers would cut our hair short and dress us like boys to avoid being selected. I think we all understand what's going on here. Den mothers would hide the older girls in crawl space of the basement for hours so they would not be selected by the soldiers. 15-year-old girls like my sister Takuhi would have suffocating experiences from the heat in the crawl space. We lived there for about four years, survived the harsh times and many, many illnesses. My older sister took care of us like a mother. When there was an armistice, we were transported to an Armenian Orthodox church, which had a big courtyard and many rooms. Here we were provided ample food and clothing, and all of us were really happy at this place. Finally, we were saved from the black destruction of the Armenian nation. This is the story of my grandmother. Something she never told us until after she'd passed away. So with that sombering note, I want to uh, let my colleague Charlie Benjamin, who Mark will introduce in a minute, talk about the work that we do today and how important it is for us as Armenians to remember that suffering in this world continues on many levels. And the Neary's Foundation for the past 100 years has continued its work uh, that it began for the Armenians, with the Armenians, and today, having served over 40 countries around the world, um, and today has extensive operations throughout the Middle East and Africa, and as we all know all too well, uh, this type of work is in much in need today. <laughs> 